going to belabor the point we're going to jump right into the word of God and hear what the Lord would have us know today the text has already been read the gospel of John chapter 2 but if you would permit me just to read verse 11 one more time I want to do that and verse 11 says this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this opportunity to come once again on the first day of the week to celebrate you, and to thank you because you are the one who did it all. Not only did you create the universe, we recognize, O oh God, that the heavens declare your glory. 
For you created each and every one of us and you knitted us together in our mother's womb and you gave us purpose and you gave us a reality of life that is rooted in our worship of you. So thank you, O oh God, for opening up our eyes and giving us the ability to see you as our Savior and to embrace you as Lord. Now as we enter into this fall season, O oh God, as we think about celebrating those who are going off to college and all of the other festivities that we do, as we think about anniversaries and all of the things that go on during this time of the year, as we think about the stewards uh, foundation and their meeting on Saturday as we consider the, uh, the cause of Christ and the pursuit of the gospel. We ask, O oh God, that you would give us a word today, that you would give us something that would encourage us today, something that would ignite in us a passion to continue to see us the way that you see us. We pray, O oh God, that you would anoint this word today, that you would empower your manservant so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. Edify these your people today, O oh God, but do it not by might nor by power, but ultimately by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to preach today, Germantown Christian Assembly, from the title, Lessons from the Water Pots. And I want this text, John 2, verses 1 through 11, to be foundational for our study today. Lessons from the Water Pots. There are many among us who are living day by day under the dark cloud out of a juvenile mistake. Many wish that they could shake off the shackles of yesterday, but yet they find themselves chained and bound with the spoiled fruit of a youthful blunder. Many struggle because their reputation has suffered and their character has been called into question. The son of David gave us this great proverbial word that comes out of the 22nd chapter and the first verse of his magnificent masterpiece. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. A loving favor rather than silver and gold. Solomon offered in the seventh chapter and first verse of his second edition called Ecclesiastes these words. A good name is better than precious ointment. The great Greek philosopher Socrates penned these words. Regard your good name as the richest jewel you can possibly be possessed of. For credit is like fire. Once you have kindled it, it may easily be preserved. But once you have extinguished it, you will find it an arduous task to rekindle it again. The way to a good reputation is to endeavor to be what you desire to appear. There is another type of people that come to mind when I think about one's reputation. There are those who are made to uh, suffer today for an infraction of yesterday that they actually did not commit. The unmerited accusation has caused the reputation to suffer loss. Our text today is a great example of a woman who may have been buried in over three decades. Um, a loss of expectation, a reputation, a bad name for the cause of carrying the Christ. Matthew tells us that Joseph planned to 
privately put away his wife Mary because she was pregnant. And she didn't, he didn't want to make a public example of her. Mary was engaged to Joseph, and according to Jewish law, engagement was just as binding as marriage. If Joseph had, had have taken her to the magistrate, there's a possibility she could have been stoned. Because in his mind, she was pregnant and carrying another man's child. An angel of the Lord had to come to Joseph in a dream and say to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. While Luke gives us a dramatic display of the Savior's birth through angels, shepherds, and wise men, the fact of the matter is, there were many persons who were unaware of that miraculous event that happened in Bethlehem. And even though I imagine as the years would go forth and Mary would attempt to explain the miracle of her son's birth. In fact, Luke tells us that she pondered these things in her heart. Matthew tells us that after that dream that Joseph brought her in as his wife and did not engage with her sexually until after Jesus was born. Joseph and Mary, according to the scriptures, had other sons and at least one daughter. But Jesus was the one that resonated, I imagine, with everybody. There are two nuances of this text that I want you to consider today. The first nuance is found in John chapter 2 and 11. It says, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested, somebody say manifested, manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. For 30 years, Mary's blessed son performed no miracles. People knew that he was unusual. He never lied. He never cussed or fussed. He never sinned. But no one, even his brothers and his sister, really knew who he was. In fact, the scriptures tell us they didn't even believe until after his resurrection. Only Mary knew. Only Mary really knew. I want you to notice this second nuance in the text. See, let me give some of the young theologues a perspective from this one simple, humble pastor. When I read the scriptures... And when I read the stories, I don't know how you do it, Pastor Graham, but I just kind of sit back and hover over the scriptures just for a while. I just kind of meditate on the scriptures. I just ask God to just, just show me something in the word of God. That's how I do. I just spend time just looking at it. And I'll drive in my car and just think about it. And I'll even be at the schoolhouse walking the hallways of the school and sometimes just think about what God is saying. There's a second nuance that came to me uh, not too long ago, and the text says here, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. For 30 years, he did no public ministry. And I've read those who have written over the last two millennia of and. Some have suggested, well, maybe he did some private miracles that Mary and Joseph were aware of. I don't know. But according to the text, he did no public miracles. But the mother of Jesus said to her gifted son, they have no wine. Look at Jesus' response. First, he says, woman... Some have suggested this could be a derogatory term, but it's, 
And that culture, not really a derogatory term, it is an accepted term of that, of that time. He says woman, but the next thing he says is a rebuke. Christ says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. This was a statement that would have been familiar to Mary and to any Jew of that land. It was an idiomatic statement that was often used. Even we find it in the Old Testament. And when you take the statement literally, what Christ was saying in the Greek was, what does this have to do with you and what does it have to do with me? Why are you bringing this issue up at this point? This lack of wine has nothing to do with me and has nothing to do with you, mother. Then he says to her, my hour has not yet come. This was a phrase that John liked to use in his gospel. My hour has not yet come. Do you remember in John chapter 17 when Jesus would pray that prayer to his father? The master would say to his father, father, my hour has come. Glorify your son that I may glorify you. My hour has come is used to describe the coming of his death, burial, and resurrection. It is how we make our way through via salvation. But Christ says to his mother, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. This is not the time in which I want to be glorified. Jesus told his mother, it's not my time for me to display my glory. I think about those who have written about this text and have offered commentary over the last two thousand years over this text and many have come to suggest the reason why Mary made have made this request to her son. There are some who have suggested, well, the text tells us that it was on the third day and they were going to have this marriage and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding and Jesus at this time would have had maybe about half of his disciples and, and it was customary when you came to a wedding that you brought some wine with you. That was a part of the Jewish tradition. And maybe Jesus, because he was poor, maybe he didn't bring any wine. So maybe Mary was saying, because you didn't bring anything to the party, they have no wine. Others suggest that this wedding would have been probably a family member of Mary, and maybe she had some engagement, some involvement in the preparation for the wedding, and it was a disgrace to run out of wine at a wedding. So maybe she was saying, well, son, this is our cousin who's getting married, and they have no wine. If I had time, I would go through a whole bunch of other commentaries that have come down through the best and brightest over the last 2,000 years, Thomas Aquinas, I'm sure you've heard of him, he argued that this was actually the wedding of John, the apostle. I don't think that's true, Pastor Grant, but who am I to disagree with Thomas Aquinas? As I thought about this text, I, I said, well, one, another possibility could be that, that Mary was saying, it's been 30 years. 30 years is a long time. It's time for you to display your glory. It's been 30 years. I thought by the time you were 18, maybe you might display your glory. It's been 30 years. And Joseph at this time was more than likely already dead and Christ had taken responsibility for his mother. It's been 30 years. They have no wine. Maybe there were some in the community who said, you know, you know, um, Mary is a very righteous woman, but about 30 years ago she was pregnant. And we don't know how that whole thing happened. All we know is she was pregnant. 
She's a great woman, but she was pregnant. It's been 30 years, and, G and Mary says they have no wine. But the amazing thing, after Christ rebukes his mother, she shows her humility to her own son, and she says to the attendants, whatever he wants you to do, you just do it. Which was an exclamation of faith. You just do whatever he wants you to do. Whatever he says to you, just do it. And I've come here to remind somebody today that we serve a God who is able. And maybe there's somebody in this place today who says, Pastor, I got kind of a sort of reputation. There's some things that I've done a long time ago I'm not proud of. Or maybe you've been accused of something that you didn't do. And you're still made to feel the brunt of, of an action that you actually never committed, but you're still suffering for that. And I've come to remind somebody today that we serve a God who was able to restore the years that the locusts and canker worm have eaten away. I've come to remind somebody today of what David said, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. I've stopped by to remind somebody today that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in a time of trouble. And I hope you don't mind today if I simply preach about lessons from the water pots. Pastor Grant, I've been working on a a book that I've been writing on the first three chapters of Genesis. And I kind of consider myself somewhat of an expert around biblical symbolism. And I've been spending a lot of time recently thinking about the various symbols of the Bible, particularly in the Jewish and historical context. In John chapter 2, I want, you, I want you to see some of these symbols today that we're going to talk about. But in John chapter 2, Jesus began his public ministry at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Uh, Cana was about nine miles north of Nazareth. But there are two more nuances in this story that I want to consider before we jump into the text and the, and the three principles that I want to give you. The first nuance that I see is that it is interesting to me, saints, that Jesus began and ended his ministry at a wedding. He began his ministry at a wedding and Cana, and he's going to end his ministry at the wedding supper of the Lamb. The second thing that's interesting to me is that in this text there is an obvious omission. I've done many weddings in my ministry. Whenever I am sitting before the bridegroom and the bride, I often have to remind the bridegroom that the wedding is really about the bride. I don't know how you do it, Pastor Grant, but that's how I do it. The wedding is really about the bride. It's, the wedding ceremony is really the bride's day. The bride is the center of attraction. Only the bride walks on a bed of roses. We don't stand until the bride shows up. The bride gets her own special song. The bride is really the center of attraction. But what intrigues me about this story is that the bride is never mentioned. The bride is not the center of attraction in this story. Six water pots are. Six water pots are the center of attraction. And I believe that there are some lessons to be learned from these six water pots. These six water pots are speaking to me. They are tutoring me. And I discover that our God is able to speak in various ways. Our God has spoken through whirlwinds. Our God has spoken through the articulation of a donkey. And today I want to suggest that God is speaking through these water pots. The first thing I want you to see, saints, is that there were six water pots. Uh, six is the number of humanity. It is symbolic for man and human weakness. 
Man was created on the sixth day. Men are appointed six days to work. A Hebrew slave had to serve six years. And then on the seventh, he was set free. And there are some lessons I think we can learn from these water pots. Hope you don't mind if I give you a symbolic sermon today, rooted in some symbolism, but I hope the application is true. And I think I'm in good company because when you read those who have commentated on this text over the last 2,000 years, they speak about the symbolic nature of this miracle. And I need you to understand, Saint, that this miracle is not found in any of the synoptic gospels. Matthew does not write about this miracle. Mark does not write about this miracle. Luke does not write about this miracle, only John. And John writes his gospel with one purpose in mind. And his purpose is to declare that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he uses miracles and symbols and imagery to help us see who Jesus really is. As to suggest that while Matthew, Mark, and Luke did a good job, John says writing later, I need everybody to know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the Son of the Most High. That's why John would write in John chapter 20 and many other signs, Jesus, the present disciples, which are recorded in this book but these that were recorded were recorded so that you might believe and know that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God and by believing you might have life in his name these water pots are there are some lessons that I learned from these water pots can I share them with you look at verse 6 with me it says now there were set six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. The six stone water pots were normally used for ceremonial washing of hands as part of the Jewish purification rites before and after meals. When full, each jar would hold 20 or 30 gallons. The first principle I want you to see and what I want you to write down is that in many ways we are like the water pots. When I think about these water pots, I think about me. These pots were made out of clay. These pots were fragile. These were the pots of a meager family who ran out of wine. They may have been dingy and old. We are like the water pots. The Apostle Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 4 and 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And what the Apostle was saying there was that we have Christ in these earthen vessels. That at all that we are at our best are nothing more than earthen vessels. We are fragile. We are feeble. We are weak. Many of us have dirty past. Am I preaching to myself today? At our best, we are nothing more than earthen vessels. At our best, we are nothing more than water pots. Some of our water pots have been beaten and battered. Many of us, like the water pots, have been beaten and battered by life. Life miseries have worn us out. Life tragedies have beaten us up. The only solution for feeble, fragile, battered, and beaten water pots is to be placed into the hands of the master. We are like the water pots. Jonathan Edwards, that great 18th century theologian, said this, How do the wise die as the fool? The fact of the matter is, we are like the water pots. We are feeble, we are fragile. And I recognize there are some of us who think we are better than others. I recognize there are those who think that we just all that in a bag of chips. But at the end of the day, we are like the water pots. We are fragile. We are weak. 
We are limited. And that brings me to my second principle. While we are like the water pots, principle number two says we must be empty water pots. Look at verse 7. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. The second thing is we must understand that there is nothing that we can bring to God that he will accept. Saints, we make an egregious error when we think that God needs our gifts, our talents, our abilities, and our experiences. God does not need you and God does not need me. How many talented people have gone to hell? How many gifted musicians have gone to hell? How many gifted singers have gone to hell? How many skilled speakers have gone to hell? How many wealthy people go to hell? How many influential people go to hell? The key to successful living saints is to empty ourselves before the might and the power of an almighty God so that God can give us what we need to be successful. Next week, I understand you're going to be doing some type of uh, education or college celebration. And I imagine you'll be acknowledging those who are going off to school or you'll be celebrating those who have made some achievement in life. And I stand before you as one who has gone to school, who has matriculated, who has completed courses of study, who has a doctoral philosophy degree, and I've come to remind you that all of that doesn't matter before God. What matters is that treasure that's in me, that is not of myself. It's recognizing that I must empty myself and allow God to place in me what he wants in me so that I might accomplish the things that he wants me to accomplish. These water pots are speaking to me. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. And I want to remind you that even Jesus had to empty himself in order to become the savior of the world. If you have it, say amen. Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 says this, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. That phrase, but made himself of no reputation, comes from a Greek word, kenosin, which simply means to empty oneself. And because Christ was willing to come down in the likeness of man and be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, therefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name. Every Christian must empty himself or herself if he or she wants to be used mightily by God. I remember my story. The year was 1993 in January. I had entered into the United States Air Force. I did about a semester and a half at Penn State University. My dad and I really didn't get along. I was angry at him. He probably was angry at me. So I said, you know what? I'm going to the military. Went into the Air Force with one purpose in mind, and that was to go to college on the military dime. Scored somewhat well on this test. They made me a computer programmer, and they told me I was going to Fort Meade to work at the National Security Agency. When I got there, they told me I would be working on rotating shifts, some days, seven days, some evenings, some midnights. Well, you can't go to school working on a rotating shift. I remember being burdened. I remember going into my room that night. It was in a January. It was a cold night and pouring my heart out to God. And I begin to blame God. God, why do you have me in this military? <laughs> like it was his fault, right? <laughs> I'm on rotating shifts. I can't go to school. I only came into the military to go to school. I'm not far from home. I appreciate that. But, 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 but God, what are you doing? And I remember that night praying and crying, my face to the ground. 
and hearing the voice of the Lord saying, son, I got you. I remember emptying myself before God and pouring myself out before him. And the tears flew down my face and I heard a voice simply say, I got you. That next week I went in to work and they told me things had changed. And you will now be on midnight shift, 11.30 to 7.30. And I said, but God. Amen. And because of God, give God some praise and worship. That was my miracle. That's what God did for me. And I told God that night, if, if, if you answer this prayer, I will serve you. And I've been him ever since. Hallelujah. Not perfectly, but I've been serving him. Look with me at Galatians chapter 1. Let's go there. Because Paul had to empty himself. Galatians chapter 1. Look at verse 11 with me. Paul writes here, but I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from a man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Notice what Paul says. Paul says, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. I didn't go to Peter. I didn't go to James. I didn't go to John. I didn't go to Thomas or the Andrew. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Paul would say, I had to go empty myself. You must understand what Paul was going through. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Paul was a teacher of the law. And Paul was persecuting the church with beyond measure. Then God calls him to fall off of his horse on that Rode to Damascus, made him blind, and he would eventually would regain his sight. And Paul, as he regained his sight, had to try to figure out, have I been wrong all of these years? What did I do wrong? And Paul said, I wasn't going to Peter. I wasn't going to James. I wasn't going to John. I'm going to Arabia. I'm going to get with just me and God and allow God to fill me back up. So Paul emptied himself so that God could fill him back up so that Saul, the torturer, could become Paul, the apostle. We must be like the empty water pots. When you think about Philippians 3, 2 through 10, I won't read it before you. But in verse 8, Paul would write, Yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered all things and count everything as rubbish. That Greek word is scubala. It means human and animal waste. I count it all as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Here's the point that I want you to see today, saints, as we talk about these lessons from the water pots. Number one, I'm like a water pot. I'm fragile, I'm weak, I'm worn. Like a water pot, I must be empty and allow God to fill me. And here's the application I want you to see, is that God can use those, you and me, for his glory. He's looking not just for the PhD, he's also looking for the GED. He's not just looking for the millionaire, he's also looking for those on minimum wage. He's not just looking for the talented, he's looking for the willing. And maybe there's one or two in this place, and I know this is a, uh, an experienced church, a talented church. 
a noble church. But maybe there's somebody in this place who feels like God can't use me. And I stop by to remind you from these lessons from the water pots. God can use you. God can use you. Pastor, you don't know what I did. God can still use you. Pastor, you don't understand where I've been. God can use you. Pastor, you don't understand the crimes I've committed. God can use you. Pastor, you don't know my secret sins. God can use you. Because when I read this Bible, if God can use Paul, God can use anybody. Am I right about this? If God can use Paul, God can use anybody. And if God can use me, I know he can use anybody. The next time you feel like you can't be used by God, just remember that Noah got drunk. The next time you feel like God can't use you, just remember that Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was unattractive. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. The next time you think God can use you, remember that Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David had an affair and was a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow and Job was bankrupt. The next time you think God can't use you, remember that John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer and Lazarus was dead. The next time you think God can't use you, just remember if I'm willing to empty myself and allow God to pour into me what God wants to pour into me, there's nothing my God can't do. Give God some praise and worship in this place. Let me give you one more principle and I'm going to take my seat. One more lesson that I learned from these simple water pots that most of us just probably overlooked all these years. I've learned that, number one, that I'm like the water pots, feeble and fragile and weak. I've learned that I must be an empty water pot. If God wants to use me, there's some things he got to take out of me. But the last thing I learned from these water pots, that in the hands of Jesus, the ordinary becomes extraordinary. That's what I learned, saints. In the hands of the master. I want to tell somebody today, the ordinary becomes the extraordinary. In the hands of Jesus, the ordinary becomes the extraordinary. Look at verse 7 with me. It said, Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. Let me add this parenthetical thought. You know, I was thinking about this as well. Mary said, they have no wine. Jesus says, woman, what does that have to do with me and you? My hour has not yet come. Mary says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And then Jesus blesses his mother, doesn't he? Jesus says, Mama, my hour has not yet come, but I'm going to do it anyhow. I like that. That just tells me, I always bless mom. <laughs> Whatever mom asks me to do, do it. But in the hands of Jesus, the ordinary becomes extraordinary. He says, and they filled it up to the brim. Verse 8 says, and he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the wine, that it, rather the water, that it was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, 
the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. Oh, I like that. In the hands of the master, the ordinary becomes the extraordinary. Jesus told them to fill up the six pots of water with water. Then he tells the servant to take and draw out some of the water. And then the water was turned into wine. One author commented that when the conscious water saw God, it blushed. The water was turned into wine. And, and, and then it was taken to the chief servant of the wedding. And the chief, chief servant tasted it. And then he took it to the bridegroom. And he said to the bridegroom, I don't understand something. See, at the wedding, what you want to do is have the good wine first. Because if you give the good wine first, and after the people, been somewhat dulled by the alcohol of the good wine. Then you give the inferior wine. So the servant didn't understand. The servant said, bridegroom, why did you do it backwards? Why did you give the good wine last and the inferior wine first? We've all been to weddings. You know how it was like. You know, you know, you, you, you know we've been to a good wedding. You know, you've been to an okay wedding. All weddings are good, but some are kind of okay. You know, you know, doing many ceremonies, you know, it's hard sometimes. You know, we're flesh, aren't we? And I've done multiple kinds of weddings. I did one wedding at the Franklin Institute, right in front of Ben Franklin. <laughs> and when they started bringing out the shrimp, and the crab legs and the lobster and the Philly cheese sticks just for the appetizer. I said, man, I've never been to this kind of wedding. So you know when you're at a different kind of wedding, a more affluent wedding, a more aristocratic wedding. I know you guys been there. GCA, I know y'all been there. Philadelphia Bible Fellowship, we, we, we're not used to that. But he was saying, I, I, I don't get it. Why would you give the best wine last and the inferior wine first? And here's the principle that's being taught because those who were there, Christ's six disciples and those servants who drew the water out, they understood that in the hands of Jesus, the ordinary becomes extraordinary. And that's the point that I want you guys to get today. I want you to leave here understanding this last lesson from the water pot, which says to me that when God gets through with you, when God gets through with me, he can take something ordinary and make it extraordinary. And that's good news for somebody today, especially somebody who's been struggling with a sort of reputation to know that in the hands of Jesus, God can take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. Isn't that good news, saints? Isn't that good to know, saints? That the ordinary can become the extraordinary. So I know it may have been a drunkard. He was still the one that God would use to save humanity. While Abraham may have had a problem telling the truth, God could use Abraham to be the father of many nations. That while Jacob had a problem with the truth as well, but God would change his name to Israel because one night he wrestled with God. Why David would have some problems, but God would show him to be a great songwriter and the king of all Israel. Why Rahab may have been a prostitute, but God could use her to be the ancestral mother of Jesus. What is the point that I'm making, saints? The point that I'm making is that in the hands of Jesus, the ordinary can become the extraordinary. And our God 
Give God some praise. Our God can turn water in the wine. If he can turn water in the wine, what does that mean he can do for you, 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 and for me? That's my encouragement today, saints. A real simple word just to encourage somebody today that in the hands of Jesus, the ordinary becomes the extraordinary. Give God some praise and worship in this place. Wine is often symbolic for joy. We think about the wine being transformed. It's designed to remind us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Aquinas also made that argument. He said that Jesus turning the water into wine was designed to remind those there that our God can take any situation and bring out joy. Amen. There are times when we think about our lives and the struggles we've gone through and the mountains we've had to climb and the valleys we've had to go through. We sometimes wonder what can God do with all that? But I've stopped by just to remind somebody today that weeping endures for a night but joy comes in the morning. Somebody says, I don't know why I had to go through all that hell, but I've stopped by to remind somebody today the joy that I have. The world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. Somebody can say, well, I don't know why God gave me that specific ailment. Why did God take away my sight? But I know a Fanny Crosby who said, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory to God, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Our God can take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. Our God can transform water into wine. And if you believe that today, saints, do you know that our God is able to do anything but fail? One more time, give God some praise and worship in this place.